Okay. Well, I think out of interest of time, I'm going to get started. Um, welcome to today's session, uh, co-sponsored by the BSA SCUP College and University Roundtable, the BSA Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Network, and the SCUP North Atlantic Council uh, on deconstructing how we build inclusive university housing. Uh, it's a big group today, so I'm going to ask everybody to please mute your mic. Um, and use the chat for questions. Um, I am Debbie McDonald, co-chair of the BSA SCUP College and University Roundtable. And together with my co-chairs, Donna Denio and Niyusha Arndt, I uh, wanna welcome you on behalf of our committee. Uh, and um, also in addition to muting your mic, uh, please, you can, if you use the speaker's view, you can highlight the speaker when they're speaking. We have a big group today. Um, and so if you do use the chat, know that there may be lots of questions and we'll try to answer your questions as they come in. And so, um, Rachel. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, on behalf of uh, Tony, Dan, and myself, who are the co-chairs of the BSA's Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Network, we also want to welcome you this morning. I'll just note for everybody that we are recording this session. Um, so please just make sure uh, that you don't screen share your computer um, and just note that anything um, that you add uh, in the during the discussion will be part of the recording. I just wanted to note that at the BSA, equity, diversity, and inclusion are fundamental values uh, as reflected in our professional code of ethics. And uh, we think that this particular discussion is incredibly important as we look for ways to uh, con continue to foster um, equity, diversity, and inclusion throughout our profession, our workplace, and the communities and the work that we do. Uh, so today, we, uh, as, as with every one of our sessions, we uh, look to these uh, particular principles that we like to, uh, to, to point out uh, that we value through all of our discussions. So I'd uh, begin, like to start by uh, recognizing uh, the, the wonderful uh, group of panelists and speakers that we have today, which were assembled by our facilitator, uh, Rena cheskis Gold. Rena is a demographer and is the principal and founder of Democra Dem excuse me, Demographic Perspectives, a WBE uh, DBE firm based in New Haven, Connecticut that helps organizations and their consultants make data-driven decisions for planning and strategy. One of Rena's specialties is conducting organizational climate assessments with a DEI focus. And with that, I will hand it over to Rena. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you for my panelists. So there was a time when campuses were built for white men. And there was a time when campuses were built by white men but the world has changed and as access has expanded in higher ed in the last 50 years, so did the diversity of the student body. Today, there is a campus awareness that there is no average student, that student needs and preferences vary greatly. Also, there's no average campus and I'm gonna give you an example of that later. In the wake of rising protests and greater recognition of societal inequalities, the urgency to address diversity, equity and inclusion has been steadily building. It's not just diverse individual that identities that are important. There's a collective sense that a full campus environment must both promote diversity and inclusiveness and must also feel equitable and inclusive. This is especially important in campus housing where there must be a healthy, safe, developmentally appropriate environment for residents from different backgrounds to interact and learn from one another. Whoever a student identifies or where they live during college all students need to understand diversity, equity, and inclusion because they need to be prepared after college to enter a diverse global workforce. Finally, it's irrelevant if the campus population includes a specific identity today because as we all know, you have to plan today for what will be tomorrow. So our focus today is on how to plan, design, and build inclusive spaces and housing that one, support diverse student identities, Two, solidify the commitment to creating and sustaining the best campus environments and campus community. And three, the most important, move DEI from the planning periphery to becoming a core planning principle. So now I'm going to share my screen and give you a snapshot of what diversity looks like um, at a specific campus. Share screen. Um, I don't 
know if I have permission right now to share. Let's try that again. Oh, I do. I do. Here we go. Okay. This is a snapshot of the nine state university system in Massachusetts. And I want to give you a little sense of the trend of race and ethnicity over the last 15 years. So back in 2004, the proportion of full-time undergraduate students who were BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, persons of color, was 10% of the student population. As you can see, if you follow the pink line, this has been growing steadily. And in fall 2019, it's 29% of the full-time student population. Sit. 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 That's a good boy. Someone has a dog. This is not about dogs, although we will talk about comfort animals possibly in the discussion. Um, at the same time, the proportion of white students has gone from 90% to 71%. Um, during this time, the Mass State College Building Authority has built about 6,000 new beds of housing. And so if you take this 29%, out of those 6,000 beds, about 1,800 new beds are for students of color. And let me say that um, many of the people on this call today were probably involved in the design, building, and construction of that housing. So thank you very much. Let me move on to the next slide. OK, having trouble here. OK, whoa. There we go. All right, so here's a sample profile of one of the Mass State Universities. This is an undergraduate student snapshot. And I just wanna give you a sense of how truly diverse the student population is. This, and this is based on a survey that we just did um, from my firm. 57% female, 3% actively identify as non-binary or other. 1% international. Now, this particular school does not have a big international population. This goes to show you how other schools could be so very different from this school. 7% of the students in my survey has said that they have requested housing accommodation. I have a symbol here of someone um, in a wheelchair, but there are so many other aspects of ability, um, emotional, sensory. This only covers a small piece of it. 33% identify as BIPOC a full 50% identify as first generation. A third are students who have requested financial aid and 5% are students who are vets, which puts them almost certainly in an older age category. And finally, in this particular institution, 52% are living in campus housing. So back to that number, there are about 35,000 students in the Mass State University system. This 52% holds for all of those schools, so about 16,000 students in housing, and a third of them are BIPOC students. Okay, so at this point, I would like to move ahead to um, introduce our panelists, and I think I will have them introduce themselves. Let's start with Denny. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Vinny Gore. I serve as the vice, senior vice president for residential hospitality services in auxiliary enterprises. And I also serve currently right now as interim vice president for student affairs and services and, at Michigan State in East Lansing. Chris. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Chris Hunt. I am the associate provost for community equity and diversity at the University of New England, which is based in Biddeford and Portland, Maine. Jonathan. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jonathan Moody, I'm CEO of Moody Nolan. Uh, we're an architectural firm. I'm based in Columbus, Ohio, but uh, speaking to you live from beautiful Southern California today. Nice. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Jose Fernandez. I'm a principal with Newman Architects. We are out of New Haven, Connecticut, and we have an office in the DC area as well. It's very good to be with you today. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'm going to start with the first topic. So the first topic is going to follow from the display that I just presented on the diverse student identities that might exist in a student body. And our speakers on this topic represent very different campuses. Michigan State, where Venny is, 
a large urban public university with a full-time undergraduate population of about 35,000 students, and the University of New England, Chris, a small town private university with about 2,500 students. I'd like to hear what diversity, equity, and inclusion means on these campuses in terms of student populations and their specific needs. Which are the top groups or topics that need supporting? Are there strategies that have been particularly effective in addressing problems or creating equity or parity for specific student identities? And can you give us some examples of how finding solutions may have been a challenge? Let's start with Venny. Uh, good afternoon. So I'll try to be concise a little bit. Um, uh, back in about 2014, we engaged a uh, marketing group called Cantar Future. And what they do is they uh, uh, really focus on the youth market. And so as we began to, to uh, meet with them, what we began to notice and what's also was reinforced in the research that we are starting to see a much more diverse student population whose needs um, are different than what our buildings were designed. Our buildings were designed and built um, the first group in the 1930s as part of the WPA. The second group was in the 40s and then there was the 50s and 60s buildings. And so, as my good friend Rob Lubin would say, the, these are mid-century buildings in architecture, which were designed for a very different group. And as we began to uh, think about um, our strategic planning process, what we really wanted to do is to really understand our student population. And, and so um, the process of having students engaged and having a very diverse group engaged was critically important. What also happened about that time was uh, we saw a, a large influx of international students that just showing up on our campus in 2014 and they were uh, Chinese students that came and, you know, frankly, we were unprepared for when um, that large group of students arrived on campus. And um, one of the things we began to, to uh, understand is that we had to really engage our various different populations for the needs that they um, have. So when I think about our particular group, um, uh, we have a, we've always had historically we've had a large international student population at Michigan State. We also have a large uh, African-American population, Hispanic population, and then Asian Pacific population and indigenous students. So those are, would be our typical sort of uh, groups of color that we're concerned of. But we also have students who um, have intersectionality and in, around um, various different issues of gender and gender identity. Um, again, our facilities weren't necessarily set up for that. And so we, you know, it's one of the things we need to think about. Um, we also um, have a very uh, diverse religious population, uh, Muslim students to Jewish students to um, what we consider uh, uh, our predominant uh, uh, students of, uh, you know, who are either Catholic or Protestant. And then our non um, students who, who don't have, practice any faith uh, institution. So, um, so we have a very diverse group and we try to think about this um, as diversity with a big D. Um, and so, you know, and when we think about that, again, designing buildings weren't designed to have prayer rooms or, or to have very other different kinds of bathroom um, uh, configuration. So as we move towards, we wanna make sure that we are really thinking about our design on campus with, with a big D in mind. So I'll turn it over to Chris. <laughs> yeah, Benny, thanks for getting us started because I, I wanna echo a lot of what you just said. Um, I'm gonna actually pick up where you left off with the big D. Um, so when I think about this work, I, I think about the different institutions in which I've served and they're also different. Um, you have, uh, they, one similarity is they're, they're mostly all private institutions with one exception. Um, but right now I'm situated, I said before, in Northern New England, Maine specifically, not all the way up Maine, not, not tall up, up Maine, but Southern Maine, but Maine nonetheless. And we all know what a PWI is, a predominantly white institution. Um, I, I, I've coined a new term, maybe um, a VPWI, a very predominantly white institution. Um, our demographics at UNE, among students of color that is, is, is pretty low. 
uh, it's um, below whatever the, the average is for a similar type of institution. Uh, and so one of the things that, that I do and my professional association, the National Association of Chief Diversity Officers in Higher Education, um, we employ a broad framework for diversity and inclusion. Um, and we define it in many ways, you know, of course, race and ethnicity, many mentioned some other um, identities in terms of, um, you know, religion and gender, sexual orientation. Uh, we also think about, and, and you know, uh, socioeconomic background. We think a lot about first gen students. We think a lot about geographic location uh, because even among our white students, there is diversity that we have to be paying attention to. Um, we also have uh, some, some diversity within our uh, religious organizations. So when, we're design, when we are designing not just residence halls, but when we are renovating other spaces on campus, including our um, student union, we uh, make sure that there are our prayer rooms, for example. Uh, we make sure that there are uh, rooms for the different student organizations that have special interests, uh, like a Black Student Union or, or a Muslim a Student Association, uh, the LGBTQ support group. Uh, we make sure that those kinds of, of rooms and offices are, are available for students to, to, to um, utilize. Um, in terms of which groups kind of stand out, uh, I, you know, it's, I wouldn't say that there's one, I think it's just based on the culture of the institution uh, and each, each place that I've been at have, have different needs. Uh, so right now, the place that I'm at, uh, there, there's a big focus on rural first generation students. Uh, and when we look at the students who need the most support uh, and who are most at risk uh, academically, uh, those students who are um, you know, might, uh, might not persist, we pay special attention to those students, uh, especially in the building and design process. I, I still think that some of those high impact practices in terms of living learning programs are, are still effective. And there's a lot of um, data that supports that. So whenever we're able to uh, connect the academic program to our residential life and housing program, uh, and have specific um, diversity and inclusion focused themes show up in that process. I think um, you see the outcomes, um, you know, render themselves effective in terms of retention and graduation. Great, thanks so much. Since you both mentioned religion, I wanna add something that might be a surprise to people. So since the BSA is based in Massachusetts, just a couple of comments about Massachusetts. The U.S. as a whole um, in the most recent survey of religion is about 71% Christian and of that 21% is Catholic. Massachusetts is one of the few states that the majority um, religion in the state is Catholic. It's 58% Christian, 34% Catholic. Um, and what's interesting is that that state university that I had given you the profile of there, although it is a public state university, 75% of the students um, identify as Catholic. So that's just um, something to think about when you're talking about religion. I mean, there obviously are minority groups uh, of religion as well, Muslim, Jews, um, other groups that have spe specific needs, but um, a lot of schools are majority Catholic. Okay, now I'm gonna turn to the architectural side and I'd like to hear about how to design program and build housing that addresses the needs of these unique student groups. So some examples could be um, issues related to privacy, religious and meditation spaces, places to bathe comfort animals. What about those, um, those lizards and, um, and small horses? Where do you bathe them? Safe refuge spaces for student subgroups, maybe art such as statuary or portraits or the naming of buildings. How have architects help campuses to navigate competing campus priorities and financial needs to preserve this focus on students with diverse identities. And let's start with Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks, so that's a, it's a big topic to take on um, and I'll try to be concise as well. And In I'll three start. Minutes. Oh, 
Yeah, I'll start at a high level and work down. I think ultimately what is driving a lot of these decisions is um, student success, and it should be. Um, you know, most of the information that um, colleges and universities are reacting to is, um, you know, ultimately students are more successful if, you know, they're they feel that they're environments that support them. Um, you know, like many of the studies says that the more students have, you know, opportunities to engage on campus, closer to campus, um, and with facilities, um, the more successful they'll be. Right now, um, and in the past few years, there's been a, you know, a difficulty with how um, many colleges and universities approach um, design from the standpoint of these rising cost of construction and just an overall you know, uncertainty about where student on campus housing are trending and, you know, how they are proceeding. But um, also um, there's, you know, the many um, points of information that, that point to the fact that, you know, even things we learned from say 2008, um, the more, the more we can move towards a mixed use approach where, you know, you can integrate things that um, into one building typology um, and when you think of um, how you can um, finance those things through um, maybe private developers or off campus um, arrangements, um, it still benefits the university. But, you know, we're seeing a rising trend in saying, hey, we have all these other priorities, like, say, dining or recreation or other things that we can't get to in our, based on our funding. But is there an opportunity to bring those into, um, you know, housing um, or, or lump them together? Um, and as we approach, um, like say, for example, um, we're working on a project at Morgan State University, which is a historically black college and university, which is a whole other topic um, when we talk about uh, what it means in terms of student demographics. But the idea that we could bring dining and rec components um, into housing that is on campus, that's financed, um, you know, to help the university deal with some of these, you know, funding challenges. Um, it, it ultimately, we believe that these are the types of things that when they're incorporated into the design, um, the student success rate will go up. Um, and as students um, have access to those facilities, you know, you know, right in their residence hall or right in, you know, their facility, um, ultimately, if we can be creative and bring ideas that um, we've seen in the mixed use world for quite quite a long time, ultimately we know that that leads to better success and outcomes for students. I don't know if that, yeah, go ahead. Nenny. So, I, you know, this is a really good question. And, um, I, you know, I think that uh, process becomes real important in listening to students and understanding what the needs of the students because they vary very differently. And so one of the things about uh, this, and I'm looking at Jonathan's backgrounds that design thinking is uh, made visible. I mean, it really does thinking about design thinking and in how students are gonna use a space. And what becomes important is that the students you talk to, the students who we talk to is a diverse group who have very diverse perspectives. And um, that gives us a way of really thinking about the community that we're building. Um, there was a point in time where in uh, student housing, we were building a lot of spaces where, where there was private, privacy was the number one thing because that's what we heard students say, we want a lot of privacy. Um, I think one of the things that we've sort of found uh, as a result of that is that the, there was lack of isolation and because of the lack of public space, um, those particular living environments weren't as, um, uh, seen as it's desirable over time. And so, um, because looking at students as, as a whole human being, food becomes very important. Uh, I think Jonathan sort of brought that up. Uh, wellness is another part of that uh, in terms of physical and mental health. Uh, those all are become issues, but they are looked at very differently depending on what identity group you're in. So what we want to do is, is uh, think a lot about what, what the profession does is terms of universal design is how to make those spaces accessible and active for folks. Art becomes really important. So um, especially for students of color is that can they see themselves in this space? Do they see their culture within this space? So, um, so using all those different design elements um, become critical, I think, in, in the design process as we move forward. Something that one of you said made me think of something, something that we see a lot in our work is where campuses are making a decision to allow the private market to absorb a very large proportion of their student um, housing needs. Um, or they are building 
new um, elegant housing and there is a, a wide range then of pricing in housing. And so what this could easily lead to is a, um, is a situation of have and have nots in terms of housing. And that's a, a strong intersection with first gen, students of financial need, sometimes students of color. So that's um, just another consideration to think about as well. Yeah, I, I think you're correct because um, I think each institution sort of looks at it very differently. Um, you know, our institution is a land grant um, university. We, we serve um, a, a, what I would say is sort of the bell shaped curve. We're pretty much a predominantly middle class institution. So we've taken the stance that um, uh, renovated or not, all the pricing, it will be equal. And that's just, and we, that's sort of how we have approached it. And where other institutions may look at each building as a standalone financial entity. Um, and so when that happens, then, um, then the price points change. So it just sort of depends on where the institution is and how they think about how they finance these construction and renovation projects. I was just talking to an institution where the people in enrollment management and residential life were thrilled about the idea of, um, of stable pricing, but the finance people um, had other ideas. So it, that's, that's, that's a challenge to, to figure that out and what's the best way for a campus to go forward. Okay, turning now to the establishment of DEI as a key planning priority. Obviously, if it's a key planning priority, then the enrollment management and the res life people would win. Um, but it's clear that this isn't something that just happens. What are the processes that need to be in place to ensure internal DEI representation on campus planning, renovation, and building projects? Who or what determines who is going to sit at the table and what preparation the campus team needs to maintain a focus in the project on diverse student identities? And also let's talk about you know, all the different people who are at the table. What, what makes a good planning team to keep DEI in perspective. And let's start with Chris. Yeah, I think for any kind of project like this, like a residence hall building project, uh, it, it typically uh, starts at the very top, at the very macro level, um, at the president's cabinet or council, whatever it's called. Uh, and that would involve the, the CFO. Um, it typically will involve the um, uh, advancement and development folks. Uh, it, it will involve the provost or the um, academic, chief academic officer, uh, certainly student affairs officer. And uh, if such a person exists at the table, they should include the chief diversity officer or whoever that person is that sits in that seat. Um, so that this uh, idea of building an inclusive um, program is going to uh, be well informed. Uh, I think it's important, uh, Vinny has mentioned this a couple of times, uh, I think it's very important to involve students, not for show, uh, not to say you did it, but to, to actually listen to their feedback. Um, I think it's very important. I think it's sometimes missed that you actually get the housing people involved, like the on mm -hmm. the ground housing people, like the, the resident directors. Um, you know, we're going to get students, get the RAs involved, th those people who are on the ground doing the work every day, uh, who know what they're talking about. I think it's important also to involve uh, the student support offices um, and the advising offices. Typically, those are the ones where you'll have disability support services. Uh, I think we want to make sure that we understand what are all the accommodations that we've been making uh, as we're, um, you know, building our, our our housing program that exists right now. So, uh, and those are increasing every year. Uh, there are new accommodations. Rena, you made the joke earlier about um, uh, the, the dog barking in the background or, or the, the dog command in the background. You know, so um, su support animals uh, is uh, ab absolutely a thing now um, as the diversity uh, of our students increases in many different ways. Um, so do the accommodations that we're making. So if we're building something now, we might as well think about what are the accommodations that uh, we're making right now for our students um, and you know that 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 takes time it takes effort um, if you don't get the feedback right away there's sometimes a knee jerk to say well we we made the attempt to get feedback and no one took us up on it so we're going to move i think i think we have to sometimes 
we have timelines, uh, of course, uh, but we have to do our due diligence to make sure that uh, we're getting as much feedback as possible. And again, I can't emphasize enough the on the ground feedback, not the 30,000 foot, but the, the on the ground operational feedback is what we need. And Chris, are students prepared to, um, to speak with the lens of diversity? Do they need preparation in order to do this? Uh, they're they're going to share their lived experiences. They're going to you know if we if we um, ask the questions, if especially if we have relationships with the students, um, they'll be candid. They'll tell you that yeah, this works, this doesn't work. They're typically, in my experience, they're flattered to get that kind of um, to to be brought into a process where their voices are being heard. Um, and I think it's also I think it's also important to say we are speaking to the students, but what students? The students. Sometimes we just go straight to our student governments, mm -hmm. which is appropriate and fine. But there are other groups that are not always connected to whatever student government body there is. So we need to spread out to as many different groups as possible to make sure we're getting full representation. Okay. Thank you, Jose. Jose, are I am you unmuted? Thank you. There you go. Um, <clears throat> I think a couple of things about this. Uh, first, I think we need to understand what a res hall is, right? And a res hall simply is not to um, to provide a location for beds. Uh, a res hall really uh, it's it's almost an incubator for um, a hatching of, of, of experiences that students are gonna have. Um, they're also revenue generating <clears throat> and therein lies part of the problem that we face when we're trying to figure out the DEI value of, of a result. So we're, what, what we've done and I think we've done successfully is we have our, our, our first step is to identify who the DEI stakeholders are and, and the decision makers <clears throat> and then get them to the table. And when I say get them to the table, I, I'm, I'm typically speaking to the, uh, uh, the programming end of it. So when we're gonna launch a program and in terms of who comes to the table, it, it's, it, it's gonna be res life, it's gonna be student affairs, it's gonna be uh, the director of any program that's being nested within that uh, res hall. Um, and I'll give you a quick example. <clears throat> uh, we did a project, in fact, it's a really good example because it's a design build example. We did a res hall at UConn, <clears throat> it was about 720 beds. And the champion of that project was the first year program director, her, her name's Melissa Foreman. And we recognized early that Melissa was really gonna be driving what the DEI incentives were gonna be because this building was going to house eight learning communities. <clears throat> one was for African-American men, one's going to be for Latin American women. Uh, the problem was it was a design build project. <clears throat> and as anyone who's been through the design build process know, they are ripe to have program just cut out. Right? And so if the student affairs end of it says, we need the beds and I'm prepared to give up STEM program for beds, you have to fight that fight. So uh, what we did was we figured out that if we got Melissa to the table and kept her at the table to champion the efforts that what we could do was uh, Newman could take its experiences of understanding design build and how that works <clears throat> and start to build a coalition. And that's what we did. So we built an OAC coalition and we worked directly with the builder and the finance people because that's important to figure out how, how are we going to achieve the DEI goals uh, at the end of the day, it all worked out. We got the beds, we got the, um, we, we, we provided a wonderful building that houses eight different learning communities. And, and I think at this point it's still working great. What, what that told me was that you have to have the right people at the table at the first tier and at the second tier, and you have to be the voice that gets them there and underscores the importance of keeping them there through the whole process. 
Supta Nuts giving him the keys. And for us, that was very successful. For me, what it did was it informed me that part of what I needed to start thinking about in terms of approach to um, res halls, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm the higher ed sector leader for Newman, was to start thinking about building coalitions, not just collaborations, but understanding and taking ownership of what gets the others to success at the table. And so for us, that, 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 that's been a good, uh, it's been a good approach. Okay. I see there's a question that came in about this, but I will, we'll hold it for later. So our final topic is about the challenges and best practices related to hiring diverse teams, including WBE, MBE, DBE, for setting standards that may differ or exceed university-wide percentages or state mandates, and for setting expectations and training for sensitivity to DEI issues. So some examples of external teams could include architects, engineers, the construction crew, furniture or flooring or other vendors, dining teams, real estate and other consultants. For example, your friendly demographic perspectives, WBE, DBE team. Um, so I'm interested in hearing about what might be different about um, having a team for housing than a team for something else going on in university, or maybe you could just talk about the, the difficulty of, um, of finding staff for teams um, and prioritizing that. So let's start, let's go back again to Jose. Okay, so um, in terms of Newman and how we build our teams uh, for res halls, uh, it's really an interesting experience because we're grabbing, uh, we, we are recruiting out of schools and um, we're essentially nurturing these interns that we get, and, and, and if we have a good experience with them, we'll bring them back as entry-level architects. And what, <clears throat> what it does is it requires that what we have in place is, uh, we have in place our values, which is extremely important that, that whoever we're bringing to Newman understands our values. And they understand that we value DEI and we value uh, being engaged in the community. So what we, what it, <clears throat> this is kind of an interesting question because what we find is that a number of the students that we get are first gen college students. And those experiences, um, Kind of reveal a lot about the students, right? It's it's a brand new experience for them. They have no reference of going to a school. They they there's no support system. They're entering a new world and they're trying to fit in and they're trying to get going into school and they're trying to be seen. They're trying not to be seen. So it's a whole discombobulation of, of feelings and emotions. So when they come to us, we have a mentoring program. And that mentoring program is, is really multi-level. And so we're trying to get them to become good architects and we're trying to get them to understand that value system. So we will bring somebody onto a project fairly early and then try and nurture that interest and, and determine if there can be a good fit or not. And for us, it tends to be, we tend to have a good retention rate. One of the issues that we're dealing with right now, and, and, and I suspect a lot of you are, is the inequity in income for students when they're coming to, when they're in school. By the time we get them, they are saddled with debt. And so what we have to do is work with them to get them up the ladder, to get them licensed, to figure out, hey, guess what? You're, you're last in, potentially you could be first out. Right, so, 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 so professionally, there's a lot that we wanna to, to, to instill in them, to have them understand the profession they're in, uh, creates a number of opportunities, a number of challenges. So um, part of what we're trying to figure out 
And, and, and this is something our interns shared with us is that there's conversations that are happening within the schools they're at, which is how can they leave school debt free? And if you think about the notion of being able to leave school debt free and being able to go to work and being able to contribute without having that on your back, I think that would make a huge difference. So, so for us, the teams that we put together for res halls and all of our projects are truly kind of built around a value system that we have and, and our experiences working with res halls. And, um, uh, and it's, it's just been a great experience for us. Jonathan. Our last speaker for now. Oh, sure. Um, this is a big topic to take on um, and talk through. Um, and I'll, I'll do my best to kind of walk through, um, call it um, at a high level and get down, down to the granular level. Um, but I, I don't hesitate when I use the word crisis. And I think a lot of the statistics and demographic changes that you've seen, I'm still kind of marveling at the fact that um, even 15 years ago, you said a 90% versus 10% um, ratio, but the trends that we're seeing reflect overall population trends. Um, and you know, we're, we're headed towards some kind of milestone in 2041 um, in terms of both growth and changing in the demographics that we're seeing. Um, and the reason I use the word crisis is based on the, our population growth and those, the types we will be serving, um, there are not enough architects to do the work. Um, there's not enough people. And, and if we don't get ahead of it, um, you know, we will be facing a different kind of crisis in terms of how to address um, our inability to meet need. Um, so specifically looking at architecture, um, you know, the profession sits in, and specifically looking at um, black architects, um, the profession sits at about 2%. Um, and, you know, I, I chair a committee with the large firm roundtable that has a goal of saying by 2030, we'd like to see that number, um, you know, closer to four or five percent or about 5,000 architects. Um, now, there's there's that number has grown. Um, but what that specifically means um, is to focus on colleges and universities right now. Um, and the reason being is when you look at the makeup of schools, like architecture schools specifically, um, those numbers tend to sit closer to what the goal needs to be, meaning five to six percent, you know, double what the profession is. So what that leads to is kind of ultimately some of the things that Jose had even said. Um, there's a big gap of a culture of support and, and firms have to do a better job of, of recruiting those students, being intentional and in finding them, but also finding ways to nurture them, you know, finding equitable solutions that says, hey, we care and we need you to get licensed um, in order to, you know, facilitate um, the culture that gets them there. Why it's so important um, is, you know, not just the, you know, what we'll see in terms of the shifts in populations at colleges and universities by 2030s and 2040s, um, but ultimately um, those institutions pushing um, teams to reflect their student populations um, is important in the sense of, um, when I mentioned a, a college at uh, the, the housing project at Morgan State, um, that is one of the seven architecture schools, um, the seven HBCU institutions that have an architecture program. And there needs to be that gap of a student who's saying, hey, I'm interested in being an architect. I wanna learn what it means. I'm at this school that's building all these new buildings. You know, can I see myself in that process? Like, can I see a path that says I can be successful as an architect? So it's also important for the schools to say, hey, in the work, in the things that we're doing, as we're nurturing you to become a successful practitioner, here's an example of how the school is doing that and that there's a successful path for you, ultimately saying that, um, you know, you can be successful um, in this field and in this path as you're going from college into the professional world. Um, the, the one thing that I would say is, is a key in that element as well um, is to be specific about um, meaningful roles. I think, you know, there's many a conversation about um, small roles or side teams or small projects where it's like, oh, yes, somebody put their name on the list of consultants that would hi was hired on a team. But to be able to say to that student, to that intern, hey, this is what, you know, I helped to craft this. I helped to carve out this specific role or this is the impact I made on campus. Um, you know, you, you can't put a value um, to what that means um, for those students. 
So just a thought, um, I don't have statistics on this, but so many architects that I know have um, typically a father who is an architect. So there's this intergenerational transfer of identity. And um, if we're trying to get a new and different population involved in being architects, how deep into the pipeline do you need to go? I mean, what, what's, the right, what's the right age? Fifth grade, high school? Jonathan, do you have a thought about that? Yes, yeah, so I, the statistic is specific. Typically, most architects you, you know, have met another architect by the time they're in middle school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of, you know, says, hey, you know, we need to be intentional in trying to hit, you know, elementary and middle schools to, to make sure, you know, you know, people are, you know, seeing architects at career days and other things to say that there's a path in the profession. But um, for the specific, um, you know, challenges of the profession right now, I think the focus has to be on, um, you know, those fourth and fifth year, you know, students or those graduate school students who are about to enter the job market or will be coming in soon to make sure that we can get them on a path towards licensure by 2030. So as a small um, WBE, um, I have had some thoughts about how to incorporate people in a team. So let's say you need to build something and you're going out for construction and you need a big construction firm and there isn't a, a, you know, a, a, um, an MBE or a WBE construction firm. So we're working right now with a, a building authority to um, help them define their first DEI strategy. And one of the items on that is you have to ask or require the big organization to take on a smaller organization to mentor them. And as you said, Jonathan, you know, not, not, not a rinky dink piece, but like a real piece of the project, mentor them, bring them up, provide support so that there can be, um, you know, teams can have lots of different players on it. And, um, and that's when the ways that you bring in a small group to, um, to, be, part, to be part of the team. I don't know if anyone else has anything else they want to say about teams before I. Well, I would add, <coughs> excuse me, Brenda, I'd add that in, in that same thread, that this whole notion of building OIC coalitions supports the same intent. And, and, and I'll go out on a limb and say that of those three, the construction industry has, seems to have a better grip on getting DEI plugged into what they're doing, right? It, it's, it, and, and it may be the difference between uh, serving an internship and serving an apprenticeship, right? It's just how you're integrated. But you can go onto a construction site and people of every flavor there, gender there, and they're all working together at various levels. The coalitions that we built have allowed the builders to allow, to have the architects are, are, are not yet licensed architects get more ingrained into what's actually happening on these projects, not just the representation of, okay, you're gonna go into the field and you're gonna look at X or Y or Z. And, and, and that's been very beneficial for us, has been very informative for our, uh, for our teams and for our, our new hires. It's, it, it's remarkable how well that works. Okay. So um, some closing remarks for me and then I'll open it up to questions. Um, my teammate, Carol Shuckman and I recently wrote an article on formalizing a DEI strategy for Akuho Eyes Talking Stick Magazine. And I'm gonna um, draw on that for some of my closing remarks. So to appropriately address DEI in housing, a few things really need to be present. One, visibility. For example, a post admission statement and very clear guidelines for hiring, whether it's RAs in, you know, internally or external teams. Number two, a budget that reflects a commitment to making DEI a core planning priority. You can start having DEI within housing with one person or maybe a half a person, but if you want that program to really be a priority, there's gotta be an appropriate budget. And that's gonna have to come from the top, which is something that Chris mentioned. Um, number three, thoroughness. 
ensuring that every initiative includes someone or something dedicated to DEI. It, in a way, it's so simple. It's, it's circular. You say, okay, every project is going to have someone that's, that's their responsibility. They, they have to have that lens. It may be very small, but someone has to be um, targeted to speak up on that topic. And then the fourth thing is longevity of process, an awareness that a commitment to DEI isn't a one-off. It's an ongoing process. The world is changing and it is changing in the direction of increasing diversity. And, and if there's longevity of process, also an awareness that you have to have assessment built in to actually evaluate the impact of your DEI initiatives. You just can't say that you're gonna do things and then move on to the next project. You actually have to do a post-occupancy assessment and determine how well it worked. So our hope today is that what we heard should give all the professionals listening um, fuel and fervor to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority in campus housing, whether you're the campus professional, the consulting team, or even the parent of a college student, you, you too can speak up. So that's it for my comments. Now let me take a look at the chat and see if there are some comments here. Rena, can I make a comment? Absolutely. So I think, um, and thank you for, for what your closing statements there and for the panel. I think, I, I feel like I would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge. So one of the things about DEI, right, is that you need to maintain that you're current. You need to continue to study, language evolves, uh, and, and you need to make sure that you are uh, studying to make sure that you are, um, have, have the right lens for the work. And so as I think about that, and I think about other things, we don't know what impact COVID and all the you know, COVID accommodations um, that we've made are gonna have long-term in terms of enrollment, in terms of the um, demographics of enrollment, in terms of our campus planning and who's gonna stay on campus and yada, yada. So, um, I think it's going to end how we design building programs, um, you know, because that we could be taking more and more advantage of the online space uh, and distance education. So, I think that's going to be important as we, um, you know, think about campus planning, even regarding DEI. Um, and um, some one particular COVID era um, innovation, I guess, is to turn double rooms into singles so that people don't have roommates and whether or not students are going to be, to say that they like that or they didn't like it or whether an institution can handle the cost implications of that. That's, that's a question that's gonna be for next fall immediately. So I just wanted to put that out there. All right, some questions um, from my old friend, Lonnie Raven. Our kids went to camp together. Um, hi, Lonnie. What architectural elements can be included or considered in housing? for maximum comfort of a diverse student body. And obviously okay. different parts of that body will, uh, student body, you know, will, will have different things will make them comfortable. Anyone wanna yeah. respond to that? Sure. Um, I, I, I think they, <clears throat> I think for us, what we have found that uh, tends to be flexible spaces, flexible spaces that can have multiple uses at various times are, are typically an easy, uh, uh, an easy consideration. So whether it has to do with supporting a variety of uh, religious and cultural needs, a flexible space will be able to do that. And, and, and when I was speaking about the design build aspects of, of, of horse trading, that was how we were addressing some of those issues. Um, and in fact, actually, one of the other questions was about um, what are best practices for creating flexible spaces so that a program doesn't age out too quickly um, and the space can be repurposed. Does anybody have any examples from institutions or projects they've worked on where um, something has been completely repurposed because of changing needs and preferences? Bathrooms, signage. Um, well, lighting. yeah, uh, I was going to say that what seems to be the perennial uh, issue that goes around is what are we calling restrooms? How are we identifying them? Right. <clears throat> and um, after going around and around, we find at, 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 
an institution which we're working in right now, we all settled on restroom. That was how they were defined. It was it was the most uh, it was the easiest way to make the catch all because that's a very important issue that can be uh, a landmine if not handled correctly. All right, so here's a comment that I think is kind of directed to me, but I'm going to open up to others, which was, um, please clarify your comment about the need for appropriate budget for DEI inclusion. Assume not capital dollars, but rather fee dollars to broaden outreach and strategic listening. Um, that is, for, I'll, I'll start and then I'll open it up. I mean, I, I was thinking specifically about um, staff members. So um, Chris mentioned whoever your DEI specialist is or the highest DEI person at university, there are still universities that don't have a DEI specialist. Um, and then that filters down to people in res life to say, we're defi we're, you know, we're setting up a new, um, we're, we're building, we're renovating, we need to find somebody with that lens. If there is somebody who's got the overview at the campus, then that certainly makes things simpler. So that's just the beginning, that's the beginning of budget. Um, other people have thoughts about other aspects of budget and how DEI could be um, could be the program that's lopped off. Uh, Rena, if if I could just sort of talk about restrooms, sure. In here, um, I think the other thing that we need to be thoughtful about is a number of our students who are transgender do not come to our campuses identifying as tra as transgender and. Um, or going through that process. So uh, having a restroom that is available that's gender inclusive restroom becomes pretty critical to that, um, to that community. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, as architects sort of thinking about that, we tend to think about that in terms of uh, um, if I'm uh, sharing room and I have a restroom, I'm with a roommate, I may be going through a gender identity um, transformation. So my parents know me as one gender and I may be going to another gender and I'm with this roommate. There becomes tension in, uh, in that environment. So I just want us to be thoughtful about as you're designing buildings. Uh, in terms of the other, um, you know, the question on staffing and, and, um, and DEI, uh, I think what you're beginning to see, and I'm sure Chris will sort of talk about this, is that um, you're starting to see uh, universities think about uh, DEI as not just one person's responsibility and office responsibility, but it, it's a part of what the institution ought to be thinking of across faculty, across the academy, whether it be in, in uh, student affairs or other places. So I think that's what you start to see happening across, uh, across campus. That's what we're starting to see. And you see that at probably more of the more resource uh, universities and then it'll start to um, filter down. But I'd be curious about what Chris thinks. No, I, that's exactly right. When we were, when the question was posed, you know, there's one thing to have a, a separate DEI budget, which I appreciate. Um, I would argue that it should be embedded throughout the project um, and uh, you know, thus everyone's responsibility. I, I do believe in that leadership piece though, having someone there that brings the expertise and has the lens um, but I think that's important to build throughout the whole program. Does anyone want to tackle the question of budget? You know, have you seen any projects where um, the, the budget is a problem um, with keeping DEI as, as a focus? I wouldn't or, say necessarily. Go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to say, I wouldn't say necessarily a problem, but I think it can be leveraged to identify, to to uh, uh, to talk about what's about you know how things are valued um, and I you know I just finished a book that I uh, it's called uh, the conversation by Robert Livingston um, that I think is worthwhile read um, but it I was excited to see at the end of the book when they got to discussions about um, specific um, examples um, that organizations can utilize but it highlighted. Um, Massport um, in Boston and you know how basically by taking a you know across the board you know every single discipline every single participant um, in the project 
um, you know, and budget equity, all of it is required to meet, you know, a certain, you know, threshold um, and, and to take a kind of radical approach that says every level of participation is required to meet the it's not just kind of what we've seen historically where it gets skewed one way or another where you know one discipline is really high and another is really low um but that speaks to you know and for me where it really resonated is when you see that say hey um you know dei has to be thought about in terms of investors in a project um that is, is one of those things that kind of begins to automatically create a, a prioritization of you know that says not you know, we hope that we reach this number, but say, hey, th this is a real priority in terms of what we value in this project. I think that's a very fitting end to um, where I wanted to go with this. Um, I wanted to thank all the presenters and excellent questions, everybody. There are some that we couldn't get to, and maybe um, I'll coordinate with the BSA group and they can put something on their website or we can put something on my website. I'm gonna turn it over now to Debbie McDonald. Great, um, thank you all. This has been really super and a topic that um, I, I think we're all aware it could have been a, a half day symposium really uh, to cover uh, the issues that are really critical as we look forward to um, the future of higher education as we mentioned the demographics and how we, we respond to the various needs of our constituency group, the students. So thank you for that. Um, we will uh, have a recording up on the BSA website. So if you're looking or you wanna put, uh, uh, send some information to your peers to be able to watch this, look on the BSA website and there will be a link to that. Uh, we have uh, one more upcoming BSA SCUP session this, this spring summer uh, about outdoor spaces. We're trying to look forward after the pandemic and not sort of, sort of rehash where we are, what we have to react to, but we're trying to look forward, take those silver linings, move into a new era, take things that we've learned that are good, leave behind those that, that we're not worried about uh, not having to revisit. And, um, and so outdoor spaces is something that's come up as a very positive thing. So we're gonna explore a little bit of that uh, over the summer. So uh, to you uh, for a final wrap up, Rachel. Great, thank you so much, Debbie. Um, and I want to thank uh, Rena and all of our speakers today for such a wonderful, informative session. I'll just highlight a couple of upcoming programming um, items for the EDI network at the BSA. Uh, the uh, EDI network has a, a book club that explores various types of literature and other types of publications uh, relative to our conversation on equity, diversity, and inclusion in our profession. Uh, their upcoming uh, next session is on July 9th at noon, which is also on the BSI's uh, EDI Network uh, website. Uh, this, this month, they are uh, exploring the book, The Color of Law. Uh, uh, the Boston chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects, BOSNOMA, has their next meeting on June 29th in the evening, so please look out for that. And our next meeting, uh, our last uh, meeting of the summer also for the EDI Network will be on July 21st when we'll have an open forum discussing our programming for the fall of 2021 and the spring of 2022. So with that, we will thank you all for joining us today. And once more, just a, a wonderful thank you to uh, our facilitator and all of our panelists today. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you all.